Hi, I'm Tam with the Scope with your solar storm forecast for the week of August 5th. We'll begin this forecast with this little bit from Brian Williams. We apparently just missed becoming part of a huge story. Scientists say a massive solar flare two weeks ago just narrowly missed hitting the Earth. If it had, it would have caused an EMP. That's an electromagnetic pulse big enough to have knocked out power grids and communications, including cell phones. One expert in Washington said it's like Russian roulette and warned an incoming weapon could do the same thing. As much as I'd like to blame Brian Williams for this, he's not the source. The source is actually a panel that was held by Artemis Strategies that talked about the EMP threat to the national grid. Now the information in this video is very interesting and I encourage you to check it out. But the report of the carrington size solar event is incorrect. It did not happen two weeks ago. This story has managed to get all over the web and because I've gotten so many questions about it, I thought I'd put things into perspective and give you an idea of what a Carrington sized event really is and whether or not we've had any lately. Let's start with the storm of the week. This plot shows how scientists measure the strength of storms using something called the DST index. And some of you might remember the geomagnetic storm of June 1st, which I have circled here. Now if we pull up our KP index, which is our stoplight chart, where red means storm, yellow means unsettled conditions, and green means quiet, you can see that this storm actually was a moderate level, had a KP of 6, which meant that we actually had aurora clear down as, as far as Wyoming. We had uh, disturbances in the GPS, Wi-Fi, and cell phones. I had people reporting all over the world telling me that they had just a few problems here and there. Now this represents the storm of the decade. This is the strongest storm from solar cycle 23, which is our previous cycle. And you can see DST dip for this one is much greater. If we pull up our stoplight chart, you can see again, now you get a much uh, greater geomagnetic disturbances. KP went as high as 9. You actually had aurora that came down as far as Texas. And disturbances were all over the map. How about the storm of the century? or maybe at least the past 50 years. For that, we go to March 1989. Now, this event caused the total collapse of the Hydro-Quebec power grid for over nine hours. Now, I don't have a stoplight KP index chart for this particular event, but if we look at Aurora, we can see that the Aurora almost completely covers the globe. In the North Pole, it goes as far south as Mexico, and in the South Pole, not only does it cover all of Australia, but it actually even reaches parts of South America. Now remember, anytime you see aurora, that means strong electrical currents are traveling through the upper atmosphere. So things, anything electromagnetic, like your Wi-Fi signals or your cell phone signals, your satellite communications, it's all disrupted. So that was the storm of the century. But what about the 500-year storm, the Carrington event? What would it look like? Well, luckily, a few years ago, scientists looked at the magnetic disturbance on the ground during the Carrington event in order to reconstruct the DST index. This is what it would have looked like. More than three times as intense as the March 1989 event that caused the Quebec outage. Now before you dismiss the Carrington event as something that could never possibly happen in our lifetimes, let me show you an event that I believe the Artemis Strategies folk were really talking about. Now on July 24, 2012, Stereo A made this measurement of a solar storm. Now what you're looking at is magnetic field. But in the top panel, we show the BZ component. And the only thing you need to be concerned about is whether that BZ component is north or south. Because if that were hitting Earth, if it were northward, you would not have any storm. But if the component were southward, then you would have a storm. Now the bottom panel shows the total field strength for that particular solar storm. So now let me overlay the storm of the decade, which was the November 2003 storm. And you see that in blue. And what you immediately notice is that the southward feel is about the same. So this storm in 2012 would have created a storm as strong as the storm of the decade. Now the interesting thing about this when you look at the bottom panel is that the storm from July 2012 is actually almost twice as strong as the storm of the decade. In fact, when you compare it to the storm from the Hydro-Quebec outage, that storm only reached about 73 nanotesla, it's estimated, where this one is nearly 100 nanotesla in strength which means the potential that this storm had for causing damage was far greater than even the Quebec uh, storm, which was the storm of the century. So what does this mean? Could this have been a Carrington-like event? Well, if it had been oriented differently, possibly. But I guess the take home from this is that the sun is like Forrest Gump, who's always throwing us chocolates. We, we never know what we're gonna get. We could get a decade-like storm, but if you flip it upside down, it could have been the storm of the century. 
And that brings me to my latest forecast. The sun has been very busy this week, as you can see from this beautiful prominence eruption. As a matter of fact, the whole disk has been busy with ejections all around the limb, but it's been pretty flare quiet. We did get one partially Earth-directed eruption. You can see it right there. When we switch to coronagraph view, you can see a very wispy thing coming off in the C2 field of view. We pull out to 30 solar radii. You can see it expanding outward, but it looks like it's going to hit southward and westward of us. When we switch to our solar wind prediction models, this is Enlil, the top panel is density. You can see the ejection blowing off to the west and to the south of us, so it should give us a, blan a glancing blow. Uh, we're not expecting much. As a matter of fact, it's overdue and we haven't seen it yet. But one thing that isn't overdue is the wind from this coronal hole that's really equatorial. We're seeing it right at the equator and it's given us a nice blast. You can see it here. Here's the solar wind. You can see the speed picking up and it did give us a nice geomagnetic disturbance. It was enough to get us some beautiful aurora clear down in Maine. You can see this gorgeous lighthouse picture that I'm including here. So what does the sun have in store for us this week? Well, these are synoptic charts that show all of the active regions all over the sun. The two vertical lines denote the east and west limbs, and they bracket the Earth field of view. Now on the left are all the far side active regions that we're watching, and the circled regions show newly forming ones. Now everything is stable thus far, but we're watching for activity, especially for flaring. Now the dark region is a coronal hole that's also going to be rotating onto the east limb within the upcoming week, and from that we can expect high winds, which will actually give us more opportunity for a geomagnetic storm. So for this upcoming week, I'm not expecting a lot of flare activity, but if we return to the disk and you look right there, that is a partially Earth-directed solar ejection. Now it's too early to tell with the prediction models whether or not this ejection will hit us partially or graze us and exactly when it's going to hit. But I'll be monitoring that very closely over the coming week. Expect around three, maybe four days, we might get a small uh, geomagnetic disturbance that could cause issues for your Wi-Fi, your cell phones, your GPS but I'm not expecting a monster one at this point. So outside of that, your space weather looks pretty good for this upcoming week. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching.